Okay, hi, um, thank you very much for giving me a bit for me to chat. Uh, Jonathan's given quite a good introduction of what I did and why I went. So I'll just um, crack on um, about your know, fantastic time I had last summer, which seems a long time ago now. <laughs> So what was it all about? So there's a research promise was, you know, insects are evolving as to do with climate change. You know, you know, things are changing differently. And in particular, blue-tailed damselflies were noticed to be expanding their range to higher latitudes in response to the warming climate. And they were showing genetic adaptation to cooler climates at that expansion front as their range expands. And this work has been read by um, Leslie Lancaster and the School of Biological Sciences at Aberdeen University. So that's, there's been quite a lot of work gone on looking at how species are adapting to climate change with a particular emphasis on damselflies by uh, Leslie and our team. And this uh, adds to work that was done in Sweden and Scotland in the past. And so the, the goal of our project is to obviously go to Norway and Finland to, to collect more information about um, blue-tailed damselflies to add to that wider project. So we were trying to look at collecting 20 and males and females from at least 40 sites in Norway and Finland. Um, uh, you collecting specimens from the south of the range or middle of the range and then from that range edge as, as it moves north. And to try and find the range edge and collect specimens from that edge. And then we were also collecting information about how much effort we took to find individuals and data on other species that were present um, at the site and some basic data on habitat and then usually about location and weather. And this is there's a, a bit of an overview of where we went. Um, we started in Finland um, first at the beginning of June and basically headed north to about 64 degrees north. And see, this is Shetland here, so we're quite far north. Not quite the Arctic Circle's up here, so we didn't quite reach the Arctic Circle. And then in Norway, we started in Trondheim, and we went north to Terak, that's 65 degrees north, and then headed back south all the way around the coast in Norway. So a lot of, you know, two, two very different countries, very dramatic uh, landscapes as well. So what, what about blue-tailed damselfly then? Well, you know, it's you know, a very common extensive species, got lots of different habitats, you know, doesn't like acidic waters particularly. You get very different colour forms, males and females have different colour forms, especially when they're immature. Um, and we were collecting information on that, you know, on that, 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 the different forms. And then you know, they're, on, they're on the wing from early to mid-June to mid-August. So that was generally um, the period we were there. So we were perhaps a little bit early in Finland for the flight period. So that's the, the, the species in question, you know, found in this country, so a very common species. So collecting this wouldn't have a big impact on populations. I, um, I went with two super people, Nikki and Laura, um, Nikki is the project lead and, and Laura was like myself, a field researcher with a bit of a background in um, entomology, Well, Nikki had a background in plants primarily. And I was there to help provide the sort of odonator expertise. We had a lot of luggage because we were away for over two months, as you can see. I also had to carry all our kit to do with you know, the research, the samples, the, the lab we had set up in the evening. So. Um, and we were away for just over two months. And this is how we would equip ourselves in the field. We had these very big sweep nets to try and catch um, damselflies. And we had these little cages to put them in when we caught them. Um, and we would generally um, aim to catch blue-tailed damselflies and anything else at the same time to try and estimate what else was in, in the sites. And then once we'd done our, our day's work catching things, we had to process everything in the evenings. And that would be sexing the individuals, um, according to their color form, whether they were mature, mature and immature wings, did they have parasites, and then do a digital scan of the, the, the animals. Um, and then stick them in ethanol um, in these little tubes. So that was the end result of all these samples that we collected. 
and then they, they would be then sent back um, to Scotland um, for DNA analysis and, and, and measurement work. Um, here's a good example of parasites. Some individuals had a lot of parasites. Um, he's, in, he's got loads on this one, and sometimes they had little tiny microparasites in here. We decided not to count those because they were so small, it took forever. We, we, we focused on collecting information on macroparasites as well. In Finland, uh, we stayed in some fantastic accommodation. Generally, it was in campsites in these camping cabins. So some of those were um, quite basic, some were a bit more luxurious, but usually all in fantastic settings by the lakeside, usually with quite a lot of mosquitoes in the evening, um, but not so much during the day. <clears throat> Finland itself is just uh, a land of lakes and forests, basically, it's pretty flat. And so um, wherever we went, it was just lakes and forests, lakes and forests forever, it seemed, um, which is quite different um, from in, in Scotland. And yeah, this is an example of some of the different types of your know, lakes that we had, all surrounded by forests. Um, so there's a huge variety of different lake forms. Big, big as we went, we, we chose different types, big, big lakes, big ponds, small ponds, some slow flowing rivers, um, wherever we thought we might find um, new blue tailed damselflies. Um, but what we found is because um, there were so many trees, it was quite often difficult to access the, the, the side of the lakes to actually do the sampling. Um, and in Finland, they're mad about um, swimming lakes. So most lakes had a swimming beach, which um, had a platform, I had changing rooms and barbecue pits and toilets and stuff. And these were generally places where we found we could access the lakeside and actually do some sampling. Um, but that might not necessarily be the best habitat for blue-tailed damselflies, but more a case of where we could actually get into the lakesides. Uh, by chance, we were um, in, a, in, a, in a museum in Finland, and I picked up a copy of this book, Dragonflies of Finland, by, which is a fantastic book. I didn't actually buy it, but I photographed all the relevant information, which had some really useful stuff about um, flight times for the, the species in Finland uh, and distribution, and then some great keys to try and help key out some of the um, damselflies. And, and Sammy gave us some advice and uh, I was in contact with him. He's, he, he has a fantastic website. So if you ever go to Finland, uh, look up Dragonflies of Finland and there's some great information on his website or you could buy his book as well, though it is all in Finnish. One thing we had found lots of, this is our, probably one of the most common species we found after blue tails was um, um, variable damselflies. And they have a, we had a lot of these was very dark color forms. So they look like blue tailed damselflies, which um, I noticed Laura is um, on screen today and she would groan every time she found one of these. One of those things that we, we constantly thought, oh, it's a blue tailed damselfly. Oh God, it's a variable. I mean, they were really variable. It was quite amazing how variable variables are. Um, we did find lots of other amazing new dragonflies, especially lots of new stuff to me. Like here's um, a lovely dark bluet, um, Canugrium aromatum. And, and interestingly, um, this is a, a dragon, a damselfly, a booty damselfly. It lost its head, so it had been dead for probably four or five hours. Trigger warning. <laughs> it was still moving. Oh. <laughs> Trigger warning. <laughs> we did have a bit of time off for some culture, usually finding something nice to eat or seeing some museums or a bit of art. And um, we had generally very good weather in most of the time in Finland until we got to the north of the country. And then everywhere you went, there was just these amazing spinning be swimming beaches with infrastructure. And I took the opportunity to do a bit of swimming, which was great because um, they weren't too cold. I even had a sauna and went for a swim, which again, something else the spins are mad about is saunas. Some other species, new species are hardly like here's a fantastic lily pad white face on the left hand side, a female, and then um, a raisin basket tail. We saw quite a lot of those. Generally, we saw in Finland quite a lot of tenarial dragonflies. We tended to catch those had just been emerging. We very rarely caught anything in flight on the dragonfly side of stuff. They just seem to just take off and disappear. But there's a lot of tenarials coming out when we were there in, in mid-June, early June. But yeah, lovely dragonflies, especially the, the basket tails on this white face, the huge dragonflies. 
And then some other things like an Arctic blue. This is a lovely little tiny minuscule little dragon damselfly. And then uh, this very rare Siberian winter damselfly. It's not my picture. I, uh, I forgot to take a picture of the one I caught. And then some other things like this crescent blue or an Irish damselfly. And something that we don't get up in Scotland, blue feather legs. Well, we have quite a few of those. Really see that fantastic hair on the legs there. And then a couple other species like this dark white face and a yellow spotted emerald. So we got a good selection of different species um, on our travels when we were trying to chase blue-tailed damselflies. Um, this is a, probably one of the other commonest species, um, the, the spearhead blue, or as we call it in, in Scotland, the northern damselfly. Um, interestingly, we had individuals look like this, where the actual spear bit joins up with the side um, black dots on the side. So we had a few of these individuals which confused us initially. We thought, what the heck is that? And then we keyed it out. It was actually a, you know, um, a hastulatum, but just a slight variation, which I've not seen in Scotland. We did see you know, lots of other species you see you know, in Britain, the damozels, you know, brown hawker, you know, large red eye, downy emerald. And you know, again, quite a lot of emerging dragonflies uh, with their um, exuvia. Um, most of these are not, you don't get in where I live, so it was quite good to see a lot of species that I hadn't seen before very often. Um, so in total in Finland, <coughs> here we saw that both species of demoiselle, 12 species of dragonfly and 11 species, sorry, 12 species of damselfly and 11 species of dragonfly. So we're quite a good selection of the fauna. I didn't see any really, really bogland specialists because we weren't looking in that sort of habitat. It was that more lakeland specialists. <clears throat> we saw some other things um, when we're out and about all the time, out every day, you know, snakes, birds. You see some um, cranes here, which hopefully will be re returning to um, Scotland. Um, I think I got about 80 bird species when I was in Finland of about um, which is not a bad count. I'm not a really big birder, but plenty of bird species. But some unexpected things. I hadn't realized that you live, you live in here and you see these birds all the time, like barnacle geese and field fairs. But certainly up here, you only ever see them in the winter time. When you went to Finland and we saw these species, you were know, holding territories or with chicks or feeding, which you don't see in the summer here. So that was an unexpected bonus, which I hadn't thought about until we actually were there. And field fair had to be the bird of our trip. It was seen everywhere in every field and roadside birds or you know, park or, or lakeside, there was always field fairs with us. But you know, the other thing that struck me in Finland was just how fantastic their habitats are and how rich and diverse they are. Nothing so better than the habitats around here, particularly their forests, just amazing um, habitats. And then results from Finland, this is where we went. We started down here in Helsinki. So this map shows you the, the distribution of blue-tailed damselflies in Finland. Uh, and we started down in Helsinki and basically went zigzagged up the country and all the way, not quite as far as Kajani. We were hoping to go to Kajani and because the, the, the northern record is here and we're trying to find the, the range edge where the range edge was but unfortunately when we got north the weather turned absolutely rubbish and it was really wet and cold and windy um, so we didn't really manage to collect much we got one observation from that far north so we didn't really get to the range edge um, and the other thing we didn't really quite get a lot of this very many specimens i think we were just a little bit too early um, out in the field and, and and maybe also there's not a widely abundant species at sites, I'm not quite sure, but we only collected about 10 to 11 individuals per site. Um, only about 50% hit rate when we were looking at lakes. Um, and then we had you know, our common species for the, the northern and variable damselflies. And we were getting about five or six different species on each site. Um, but you know, we didn't really collect that 20 males and females from each site or really hit the range edge, but we still got a good number of specimens. And then uh, at midsummer, we headed off to Norway, which um, 
proved weather-wise to be quite a lot wetter than Finland. Finland, we had a, a lot more uh, sunnier days. We started off uh, in the north, uh, and again, Norway is quite different to Finland. It's still a lot of forests, but there's lots more mountains and fjords and lots of lakes as well. Um, so it was quite a different you know, um, landscape. And actually, I, I preferred it. You, you had all these dramatic mountains everywhere you looked. Uh, it's quite spectacular. Again, we stayed in these camping cabins, um, which again were of varied standards, but you know, adequate for us. On this picture here, this is just before midnight on Midsummer's Day um, in Trondheim. So basically, it didn't get dark. The whole time we were there, it didn't get dark. It just had that sort of twilight mm -hmm. feel for a couple of hours every night before it got um, bright again. And there was one day we had a chiff chaff was singing all night long in our by our window, it, it felt like, and then all day long. Yeah, the lakes in Norway are bit similar to Finland, but usually with hills in the background, again, surrounded by forests, but maybe not quite as heavily forested as Finland. And the Norwegians aren't quite so mad about swimming beaches as, as, as the Finnish were. But again, like super variety of lakes and ponds to, to sample, generally all by the coast is where we tended to, to be to do our sampling work. And it did rain quite a bit. I've got lots of nice sunny pictures here, but I don't, you don't tend to take pictures of the rain. I took this picture in the rain because I had this unusual uh, species wandering through the water here. Yeah, we, I, we saw less new species in Finland, com, in, in Norway compared to Finland, obviously, because we'd seen them all in Finland, but we did get a nice, you know, bog hawker here, um, Ashna subartica, and then ruby white face, um, which you, Initially, it was quite hard to tell apart. Um, Fortunately, we did catch that in the hand. And then we had, again, some of these tiny little Arctic bluets, which are just lovely little damselfly. And then some stuff you get here, like, you know, small white face, or we just call it white face darter, and a zero hawker. Um, by chance, we managed, Penn, Laura Penny managed to see that on a rock as we were walking up a hill, which is quite amazing. And then we had a lot of teneral uh, dragonflies and damselflies that were coming out again. This is what we tended to see uh, most of those were tenerals or were just emerging. We didn't catch many dragonflies per se where we were sampling. But it did rain a lot, uh, particularly in central Norway, which it is, it is renowned for, but we did seem to have quite a lot of wet days, which was, we spent some days trying to beat damselflies out of wet vegetation in the rain, with some success, I have to say, but it, it was a bit damp sometimes, you know, like, oh, I went out in the rain again. And, a bit, and maybe a little bit colder after some very good weather initially. And, and what do you do on a really wet day when you can't do anything? You've been out for two days and there's nothing to see. But by chance, there just happened to be um, a battleship turret sticking in a, in, a, in a fort next to our campsite, which Lord and me went to see, which is quite spectacular. Something a little bit out of the ordinary, you don't always see around here. We also had some days doing a little bit of exploring when we weren't always working. We climbed this mountain, Lord and me, this is about a thousand meters, quite spectacular views. Still snow everywhere, obviously. Um, we were in a couple of the cities where Everything seems made of wood in Norway, a bit like Finland, we, all our houses are made of wood. Um, and we did see some big mammals. We didn't see any beavers, but we did see lodges and signs of beavers. Um, we did see some moose or elk um, and, and a bear, but that was a uh, stuffed one in a shop. <laughs> and then there was just a super rich diversity of wildlife it, you know, everywhere. You know, invertebrates were particularly diverse, what we saw, as was that the plants were just absolutely stunning. You know, their, their, their woodlands, their you know, roadside verges, their field edges, their you know, mountainsides, just the amazing diversity of wildlife. You have carpets of twin flower, for example, which are quite rare in Scotland, and this was just everywhere. Some of these rare species we see in Scotland were just everywhere in Norwegian and Finnish forests. And again, that's definitely one of the big things that I came back from Scotland thinking about is that 
the habitats, particularly in Norway, were very similar to Scotland, but they're just so much more diverse and rich. You know, their ground flora, it's just absolutely amazing. It makes us realize just how degraded and uh, our, even our best forests are in, in Scotland. And we've got a long way to go to actually restore them to what they really should be like. We did get some, obviously had some rare treats. Drinking <laughs> in Norway is expensive, so we didn't do that very much. Um, but we did go out now and again and sample some local food. One thing about Norway is they really do like tunnels and bridges and ferries. You know, everywhere you went was fantastic infrastructure. Um, the roads were, were fantastic and everyone was really well linked with either a tunnel or a ferry, which ran all the time, multiple ferries on short routes and lots and lots of tunnels. And so this shows us where we went. We started up in Trondheim up here and then headed north uh, just up here, we were, had hoped to go a bit further north, but we didn't manage to do that. Um, and then came back down the coast, um, the Christiansen, Alessand, and then down through central Norway to Bergen and all the way to Stavanger. So we covered a, a big part of the country, although it's probably only a third of the country because Norway is such a big country. So blue-tailed damselflies are called the coastal water nymph in Norway, which, as you can see from this map, that's where they're found. Um, we looked at over 49 sites, of which you know, more than 70% we found in fish and urine. Um, and we collected over 700 specimens, so much better success than Finland, probably because we were right back in the middle of the, the flight season. So we were averaging more than 20 individuals per site. A few sites we got that, 20 males and 20 females, but not every site. Um, and the, the commonest species this time was the common blue, followed probably by the variegal and um, northern damselfly. And we were getting about five to six species per site uh, of dragonflies and damselflies that we were collected. But a lot of driving, you know, it must have been more than 5,000 kilometers of driving uh, across some fantastic landscapes. And it didn't seem to rain for about three weeks, sometimes just for days. Um, so it was very, very wet, particularly in, in this part of the country. It was pretty wet up, up in the north here. We had much better weather. But as we went down, it just got wetter and wetter. It felt like until the last day, the sun came out, <laughs> which is quite typical. And then you get, again, we got a good range of one dem as well, nine species of damselflies and 11 species of dragonflies, so a good uh, number of species. And I think I got over 100 bird species as well. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and so our final results at the end of the day, this shows us where all the, the sites we recorded, dam, you know, blue-tailed damselfly in Finland and, and in Norway. So, and some of these are new records. Um, Again, I don't think in either country we got to the northern edge of the range. Um, you know, we had over a thousand, you know, you know, over a thousand specimens from seventy sites, over a hundred we visited. And then one of the things that we would be done next in the research project, which I started and, and Laura completed, was to take measurements of all the scans. These are all the measurements that were taken, and then the DNA was taken, and then that will then be analysed and research papers published from that work. But I'd also recommend Norway as a great holiday destination. I, I, after I, we'd finished the two months, um, my, my family came over and it's only 55 minutes from Aberdeen to Stavanger, six flights a day, flights are really cheap. Norway is expensive to, to place, but it's a great holiday destination, obviously when it's not raining. Um, but even then you can still have a great time in, in the rain if you've got the right gear. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm happy to take any questions.